All right, we should be live, guys. How are you doing? This is Eric, aka the Lord Humongous from RuleTheWasteland.com. Got JJ Johnson from Reality Survival and Prepping, and Che from Prepper Logic. So I'm going to pop up the chat here if this is working. The Lord Humongous. This is our Prepper Trifecta video that we've done every week, or not every week, but every month, based on our. Uh, well, we've all done videos based on different topics. This last one was our favorite or best bug out bag items. Now, the one thing I messed up, I couldn't remember if we had said, are we, were we trying to do our favorite and the best? Because that's kind of what you guys did. I just did my favorite. I didn't really do also do the ones that I thought would be the best. Sent an email. I sent an email to both of you guys. And I said, do we want to do most critical or most favorite? Neither of you guys responded. It was like, screw you. I'm <laughs> no, going to do both. I think the NSA must have intercepted that because I think we I think we responded, didn't we? No, I don't know if I did because I couldn't remember when I went to make the video, but that's totally cool. I should have just done both. I was kind of pressed for time on this one, but on getting it together. But I was happy to see you guys mention both. That's certainly useful information. For me, I was just thinking that the we would probably be pretty identical on the most important ones. And so it would be more interesting to hear the favorite ones. You know what I mean? So... Well, what I, did I, really, that, I really liked your che, uh, yours with the that little portable drill. I had never even considered something like that. It kind of blew my mind. Definitely have to pick one of those up. Cool, man. Yeah, the Chapman. Yeah. Which made it in USA, where uh, your your president is Trump, I think it is. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> is that his name? I think that's his name. Some something like that. Mm. I've heard some things about. Yeah, but because you uh, you can do a lot of bushcrafting stuff with a knife make notches but drilling good holes is has a lot of uses and is really really difficult to do without a drill bit it's funny a lot of people don't get it they don't understand the the uh practicality of having that mechanical advantage or capacity to drill a hole how, right. many, how many opportunities it, it opens up it just because it, I, I a buddy of mine well my mentor who lived in the woods for for a year alone uh, he would say it would take him like days to drill a hole because he would use like a bow drill. There's other way. There's other things you can do, but it, it's very, very time consuming. So right. this micro ratchet system that you can incorporate with a Leatherman is uh, is neat. You know, you can bang on benches and chairs and make wheels, pulleys, all sorts of cool stuff. So I just but I like uh, to yours. Sir, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I, I prefer the to use the Ojibwa bird snare and then tame woodpeckers. <laughs> that's, there you go. It's a little more effective, I think. But <laughs> get an army of woodpeckers to do your drilling work. <laughs> I mean, at that, that bird snare, uh, there's a hole in the uh, the wood. There, you put your little snare on top of a piece of wood. You got to make a hole there, right? So how That's do you right. make that hole? That's, That's true. Right. So you, can, you could use a little use little chapter to do that. <laughs> JJ, I got to be honest. Uh, I didn't get through yours. It was long. I had a. Well, here's work. the here's the reason. Here's the reason mine was so long, and I didn't actually intend on it being that long when I started, but the question is a harder question than just picking five objects, man, because we all got a pretty big audience here, right, that we're talking to, and and so we're trying to put forth something that is useful for people in a wide variety of situations and locations, and I started thinking about it, and just the way my head works, I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's good for me or somebody who's had a lot of wilderness survival training is going to be totally different from somebody who doesn't, who lives in suburban, you know, uh, middle state, Indiana, and, and doesn't really have any bushcraft experience. And so that's why I broke mine down that way was, was basically trying to, to the three, what, what I thought were the three most likely categories of people who would be bugging out. And so that was the, the really experienced bushcrafter, the, the middle suburban guy that maybe he's gone camping on the weekends, but doesn't have a lot of training. And then the guy who's already got the bug out location and he's just going from point A to point B. You know what I mean? Right. So that's why I broke those down. Yeah. That's why I, that's one of the reasons I stuck with just my favorite is because instead of trying to figure out what would be good for everyone else to say, you know, these are some things that I've discovered. I really like that you might not have thought of. Yeah. And I'd like to rephrase too. I did get an email from JJ. It was sent to both of us. Me and Eric got an email on uh, March 16th at 10:45 EST time, not MST. <laughs> and JJ said he watched our videos. He said you were both dominated. Dominated. Today. Pretty sure. Just saw yeah. that. I saw that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right, brother. Shots <laughs> fired. Shots fired. <laughs> 
respond. I, I was just yeah. responding in kind for the way I, I I seem to remember somebody saying something about dominating with logic and reason, and I, I don't know. I've, I've heard that in the past. Oh right, right. Okay, all right. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. In all due fairness, I didn't see your video. I'm gonna take a guess here. We're gonna do an unprecedented uh, trifecta first here. Okay. My guess is in your list. In your list. Without a shadow of a doubt, you had something security related, probably firearm related. Uh, not as the main items. Okay. All right. I was just taking a shot at the dark. I, I figured that would have been on your list a little. Oh, hey, why little. don't we why don't we run through our uh, items really yeah, quick? Then. We can do it real quick. I'll try to make it shorter than an hour. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let me see. Ah. <laughs> I apologize for my voice. I got a terrible cold right now. Um. Well, so go go for it. JJ. Go ahead and go, go, Eric. You got yours right. Okay. Yeah, I had the uh, fire gloves, the big no cry heavy duty fire gloves, which a lot of times I only take one because they are big and heavy. But I found them super useful for grabbing pots and pans, holding a stick if you have to cut something and might be a little bit iffy of a situation. Um, you could use it for all sorts of different things, but particularly for moving logs and things that have gotten hot. I found that really useful, especially in big campfires or if you have a little like stove that every part of it heats up, things like that. I've noticed that a lot of the camping gear has really short handles, things like that. And having some sort of glove that has a little bit of insulation, not just a work glove, has been pretty useful. And then I uh, just mentioned the um, water bags like Camelbacks and things like that, because as ubiquitous as they are, they just improve the experience of, of hiking, camping, or doing anything tactical related and having the ability to drink like that easily and quickly. And the uh, water filter, the Catadyne in my case, I think the pump filters like that, the sturdy ceramic ones are just so useful, so important that I enjoy having them there. And I also mentioned the some kind of optics, like these little Barska or some kind of little monocular. They're really fun, not necessarily the most necessary of items, but something that I really do enjoy using and uh, it's something that's hard to improvise if you don't have a way to see farther. And was that five? I think that was five. You had your headlamp as well. Oh, correct. And a headlamp. I, this is so useful to have light and not have to use your hands. That That's something that's just always been one of my favorite items ever since they came out with that. So I really like that monocular idea. And I was just thinking even like multi-purpose, dual purpose, possibly as a convex. Oh, he's drinking beer tonight. You see that, JJ? Yeah. Mm, he yeah, yeah he, pressured, he pressured me into it, so <laughs> yeah, peer pressure. yeah. I never wanted to shy away from peer pressure and being uh, talking and doing something. So. It makes the show a lot more interesting in about 45 minutes. Um, so what I liked your monocular idea because I was thinking dual purpose, how you could use that as a uh, potential, well, most likely to as a Fresnel lens or a fire starting uh, apparatus, I would think. So that's something I would definitely consider adding into my personal yep. bug. JJ, do you want to go next with your five or? No, go ahead. Okay, so I did the five and five, which is the five um, ones that I like and the five that you need. And this is purely from memory here. From the ones that I liked, I think it was uh, it was the Agua Canyon Boreal 21 fold-up saw, because that made both lists. Uh, Illuminate portable light, which is lightweight, portable, waterproof, solar paneled LED light, which was really cool. Uh, Chapman. Micro ratchet. We talked about that to to make holes. Um, that's all I can remember for the for that side of things. But that's okay. Seat, like a chair of some kind. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's right. I had the, like this portable fabric chair. I've had these older videos. There's a guy named. I should give him a plug here. It's a Connell Challenge, and this gentleman came up with the concept of of uh, just putting basically a piece of fabric over top of a tripod. No way to it. And I thought. Come on, I did, I did a video on that long before he did. Come on. Really? Yeah, I, I did it years ago. Yeah, I have one from years okay. ago. Yeah. I had no idea. Then maybe he got the concept from you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They are they are super comfy, though. Super comfy. Similar concepts, like same setup? Yeah, it's just basically a piece of triangle cloth. You can just tie it over the top of a tripod into each leg and then boom, sit in it. Yep. Seems like you could make okay. a decent loincloth out of it, too, if you needed to. Just oh, of course. <laughs> 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 Fair or, enough. I think a parachute, he, a parachute cloth diaper. <laughs> okay, I don't think he, he was the inventor, but he definitely commercialized it with the way that you can put pieces of wood into the top and bottom parts of the fabric. But in any event, my rationalization was that um, if you could be comfortable, if you guys have gone, done treks, I'm sure, long periods of time into the into the woods or wherever, it's 
amazing to be able to sit down and be relaxed. It, it just it does so much to you physiologically, which transcends psychologically. So quickly, for the for time's sake, I'll go through the five uh, necessities. And I, it, it's funny, the top three, I think you'd find in any survival show, one show I can't talk about because I'm legally bound not to talk about. Um, let's just say the contestants were alone. Uh, the second is naked and free. But they're limited to only bringing one item, and one of the two contest people always brings some sort of container to purify water, pot, uh, some sort of fire starting apparatus, a ferro rod, which I, I, it was Eric that said, yeah, pot, ferro rod, and knife, which are in my core top three um, across the board. Wherever I am in North America, those are going to be my top three go-to because I can do basically I can do. I've got a lot of core things taken care of with that. The two the complement of that um, being number four and five are the Agua Canyon Boreal 21 saw, foaming saw again, and tarp. You should get a temporary shelter, permanent shelter, uh, water catchments, multiple uses. Just your plain old tarp. Boom. There That's it. it. I threw a link to that video in there. I think it was about five or six years ago, something like that. Yeah, the saw, the saw is a good one. I don't think a lot of people who uh, realize how much easier it is to saw through large logs than it is to chop through them. I mean, I think it's it's still necessary usually to have some kind of chopping ability for a bunch of different reasons, but if you're seriously going to be needing up to, like, power through a bunch of thicker logs, a saw is just a game it's, changer. It depends. Yeah, exactly, Eric. And if, JJ, I know you want to get on with your list, but just to interject uh -huh. for a second, I Go screwed ahead. up in my video and I said – People are usually either a saw guy or a knife guy, and it should. I, what I and I'm watching the video and I'm producing it. And I, I let it go. It was really it was either saw or axe. I find right when you get bushcraft, you tend to gravitate to one of the two. Uh, as far as sizes of logs, I've seen a couple guys that will go unnamed that chop down huge trees and they're promoting these wild saws. And in reality, you got to look at the bigger spectrum of things. Are you going to be? Do you wish to exert that much energy? Out in a survival situation, what's the most important resource is, is the energy that you retain or sustain, at least one of them. Uh, even if it's a long-term shelter, are you going to be building a log cabin out there? And even so, you know, do you need much more than six-inch diameter? you got to contend with moving all this wood and whatnot. So something like the Agua Canyon Boreal 21 is very practical, lightweight, reasonable. It's very similar to the saw viber, you know, the old saw viber they used to have. It was a similar kind of saw. I've got one and had it for years and they made them in a 15 and a 21 inch, I think. And then they're very, right. very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes basic is good, you know. Mm -hmm. um, JJ. You're uh, up. So, um, let's see. All right. Uh, so number one was a extreme cold weather military sleep system. Um, having a having a sleeping bag i think is imperative in especially in any wintertime environment uh, with the sleep system like that where you've got the gore-tex bivy that that can can in an emergency act as a shelter in and of itself and uh keeping your core body temperature at 98.6 is vital um number two was a, a military e-tool entrenching tool um and this was for the guy that is the kind of the, the survival expert, right? The, the, the bushcraft guy with a lot of bushcraft skills and whatnot. And so making, uh, you know, debris huts and debris shelters and different things like that, when you've got an e-tool to be able to do that, it really, really helps out a lot. Um, a large stainless steel pot, you know, at least five to 10 liters, if not more. And then a two and a quarter pound Hudson Bay axe. I'm an axe guy. Oh, I'm there one, you go. I'm, I'm one of those. Cool. Um, it's just when I was a SEER instructor, it, that that's what we had. That was our that was our main tool, and we just did everything with it. So I just got really used to using it. And that two and a quarter pound Hudson Bay axe is versatile enough that you can chop, you can split, you can fell, you can do feather sticks and start fires. You can process kindling. It's small enough to do really a little bit of everything. Um, and then the last one, number five, was a SAS survival bow with a quiver full of arrows and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then m one of the caveats in my video was that I would have my EDC stuff on me, my you know, kind of level two heightened, you know, kind of stuff on me. So ferro rod, knife, you know, those kinds of things are all in that. Um, for the combat refugee, <laughs> the guy lives in the middle of suburbia, doesn't have a lot of training, all that kind of stuff. The, number one for him was a tent. 
I like the snug pack. Uh, if it's a one person ionosphere, if it's a three person, the, the scorpion three. Uh, number two is a zero degree down sleeping bag with Gore-Tex cover. Number four was a water filter, the MSR Mini Works EX. Number or that was number three. Number four was the Whisper Light International Backpacking Stove. And the reason I picked this one was because, well, not just because I'm getting ready to review it, <laughs> but also because I think you it's chill, chill. Yeah, I know, but probably because I think it's one of the best stoves as far as a stove that takes fuel, right? Not like a solo stove or the one that takes biomass, but um, it'll burn gas, kerosene, diesel, and white gas. So I think diesel too, and unleaded. It'll burn all, like everything, basically. Um, so I figured it would be easier to scavenge, you know, fuel and stuff like that if you needed to. And then number five on that one was a British Galak which is like a machete. And then, so the last guy was the guy just going from point A to point B. And he was um, military poncho, poncho liner, night vision device, PVS-14, uh, some catered in micro-pure water purification tabs, an Esbit stove with fuel tabs, and that was it. So <clears throat> just kind of the thought process for me was, it really just depends on your situation, you know? I mean, they're going to vary greatly depending on where you're at, where you're going, what you're doing, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it comes back down to what we've talked about before, like what are you envisioning for bugging out? Are you saying, are you, th are you the type of person who's saying, oh, when there's a wildfires, you know, I'm going to grab my bug out bag and go to the next safest city? Is this for when, yep. you know, total shutdown? And, you know, so like you said, if you're someone who's just saying, I have somewhere to go and I just need to be able to get there and say anything less than probably 100 miles, Bushcrafting type stuff is pro and long-term wilderness survival is not going to be very high on that list. You're going to be more more worried about traveling and security than you are specifically speaking about trapping yeah. animals, building a you know a frames and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because if you've got your bug out location picked, you just it's all just about A to B. You right. know, move as fast as you can. But the vast majority of people fall into that middle category though, where you know they really don't have anywhere to go, right. and. Uh, they, they've got some camping equipment and stuff like that. And they want to, you know, try to go out to maybe a state park or a national park or something and just hunker down until whatever it is passes that force them from their home. But, you know, it's, it's a little different situation for each one. And then the, the bushcraft guy, you know, he's the guy who's going to, he's Che, you know, he's the one that's going to go back into the Canadian boreal forest and, and disappear from society and never to be seen again, you know. Which I'm, he might do anyway. We haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Even without shit, man, he might do that. Be off grid. I could be in the wilderness right now. Yeah, exactly. um, You're like I built this structure this morning. <laughs> uh, interesting spin on things to complement what you guys were saying. And my my rationality was more in terms of okay, sure, A to B, go to your bug out location. So we've got a few in, in mind. A few in, few different places I would definitely go to, but my logic was more, what if I can't get there? So your bug up bag turns into your inch bag or your, your long-term survival bag it, by default because of fire, because of uh, an overwhelming criminal presence between you and your bug up location or something that's preventing you from getting to where you need to go. So now you need to change your plans. And I think I tap dance on that too with, with what JJ was saying. Uh, to earlier that you know it's, it depends on your situation it depends where you are geographically and your experience level i mean somebody like me we're 75 percent of our country and over a quarter million lakes in ontario mm -hmm. like i don't even think about water when i was doing this too i said i i know eric's gonna do something about water i know he is for sure and, and that makes sense because sure. because of his location um so the the geography i guess for the audience that watches this um what we choose ultimately shouldn't be what you choose. It should be based on your experience level and your geographical location Absolutely. in conjunction with, with a few other things as well. Yep. So. Totally agree. Absolutely. I'm going to see so if what, we have a couple of questions here that we can hit. Um, let's see. You're trying to get all, all caps if you ask a question or if you do a, a super chat, we'll see it more easily. I don't see any yeah. recently. Make it rain. <laughs> yeah, right. Ka ching They said, JJ, you were a seer instructor? Triple question mark. 
I was, yes. I was uh, from 96 to 2000. Was class, my class number was 9702 and, uh, at U.S. Air Force, Fairchild. Good yep. deal. Show enough. Deal. All right. I don't see any – I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning. We don't see any recently. One thing I mentioned to JJ right before the uh, – before we went live, is it there? This is kind of off topic. So if you still have anything related to this, go ahead and throw the questions up and we should hopefully be able to see it. But there are a couple things going on in the world right now that I would consider like real shit hit the fan events. Nothing crazy, end of the world type stuff, but like the flooding in Nebraska and the Midwest, that's certainly something you might have to bug out for. Or the, And certainly in Venezuela, long-term power outages for reasons unknown. You know, obviously they're in economic turmoil. So those are both situations that are going on right now that you could consider shit the fan if you were there. So this isn't just something that not just end of the world type stuff. Like if you're in these places, these are serious problems that are going to you're going to use preps if you have them. You know, that that brings up a what about top th for the next video topic, top things that preppers need to stop doing. OK, like biggest yeah. mistake preppers are making. Well, just maybe maybe more oriented towards the idea of, and what brings this up is, is you're, top, you're talking about the floods in Nebraska. Yeah. That's a perfect example of why people need to stop saying, I'm only going to bug in. Right. I'm not going to bug out. Bugging out is stupid. And people take these hardcore positions against bugging in, bugging out, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm like, you may not have any choice in the matter. You know, so if we're going to pre preppers are supposed to look at possibilities and 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 see, you know, probabilities and all this kind of stuff and be like, OK, I probably should be prepared for these variety of different things. And you just don't know what's going to force you from your home. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that I think preppers should stop doing for the benefit of the prepping society as a whole. Number yeah. one, like being <laughs> beach bags to each other. I just one word there. So it was the top five or ten blank for preppers stop what was yeah, that just, what was your maybe just top top 10 things preppers need to stop doing and then you just <laughs> fill in, stop, i'll like, tell you one right now stop um, doing you know not necessarily stop but at least divide your time in 50 percent uh, you know what maybe i'll i'll save it for the video if we do yeah this. yeah 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 okay i don't yeah, know if you guys think that's a good one but i i didn't mean to i didn't mean to get you off on a rabbit trail um, it's just that the floods are a perfect example because right now a bunch of people are having to, you know, move from their homes and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, if you, if you weren't ready for that, that's hard, hard, hard to do, man. I mean, I agree. And that's why I've always said like bugging out isn't to me, it's a tool. And to say, I'm not going to do it is kind of dumb because like you said, in this situation, your weight, your house is waist deep in water where you know, it's going to be, you're not going to leave. Or right. like in, in the Wyuego, Wisconsin incident where the propane, train derailed and it could level the whole town if it blows up you're just going to hang out and hope that it doesn't blow up you know or if there's some sort of bizarre invasion red dawn style you're just gonna be like nah no reason to leave i'll just you know i'll just fight it out like there's just all sorts of reasons that it doesn't have to be your primary plan to leave but you have to realize that there are situations that could come up that you're going to want to leave wildfires all sorts of stuff and you need to be ready for that too absolutely the biggest the biggest reason why you know, it's very easy to get your stores and put them all in one location. It's convenience. They're also they're safe. Well, then, you know, you don't want to be burying ammo on the ground necessarily. Some of you might. Um, but people, when they, they have this default stance of bugging in, I think I made a video about this a few years back. It's largely because they, they haven't thought over, they don't have any other, other, other places to go, um, and they have all their stores in one location. I think I've even mentioned this before on this trifecta thing. And that's, you know, that's fine if, if that's the case, but in your default psychology or your default stance of bugging in and to have that psychological how can i how can i rephrase this eloquently there, there's nothing wrong with saying i want to bug in but to say i'm only going to bug in no matter what is is off your rails because we'll take one instance we'll say fire boom fire at your location are you still going to bug in no now you don't have a choice now it's just you and your backpack going to anywhere else else you know outside of your bug out location or your 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 place to survive so there's very real things that can happen to your location in which bugging in is not an option you'll be forced to bug out in spite right. of any resource 
is your plans or whatever you have at that location. I do see, do you guys mind if I just answer one question? Go for it. Um, it was for me. Maybe you got, one of you guys can scroll up. I think it was from Canadian Caliber. Caliber. Yeah, it says, for Che, any events for you between Toronto and Ottawa in the near future? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I caught it as I was yapping there. There's an event, and if you guys don't mind, I'll just give myself a shameless plug here. Go for it's it. It's annual, annualpreppersmeet.com, and it's a three-day festival where I get the best preparedness individuals and survivalists in Canada, and we ramp pack ourselves into one awesome event. It's real. It's cheap to enter or to get in. I think it's like, what have I got it for? 50 bucks. Includes camping, water, everything. So and Canadian, Canadian yeah. Prepper's going to be there then, right? Canadian Prepper? Yeah, you said you had the best guys there. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. Um, I gotta stay out of that one. Uh, Sorry, I, just, I couldn't help myself. I'm not bad. Yeah, Nate's no. a good guy. He's he's a good guy. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's a nice person, and he's probably watching this too, <laughs> knowing him. Um, but anyways, he's he's of course he's nice. He's Canadian. There you go. If there's, there's an event, you're gonna, if there's an event you're gonna check out, it would be that one. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, wild edible walks to uh, off grid hot tubs. That's what I made last year, and I demoed that as an example. We got it up to three hundred and ten degrees in three hours, which is pretty cool. So kids' events too, archery, everything. It's loaded. Annualpreppersmeet.com. Drive from Ottawa and go there. Thank you, John. So I had oh, to get that no, plug in. No worries. No worries. Has anyone formally invited you to move to America, Che? After the after the Trump video. I Considering, yeah, considering the backlash, you, you know, as a prepper, you just you can't I, see Jack in, in yeah. with respect to politics. You can't say I like Trump, I don't like Trump. You just don't use the word Trump. You know, yeah. just stay out of politics in general. That's why, yeah, that's uh, why I use the term God Emperor or the All Father. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> I've actually considered our laws are so loose here, Eric and JJ, yeah. with firearms. They are so bananas that I have considered property right at the border at certain yeah. spots so I can stockpile to my heart's content and have certain firearms, per se, sure. or, you know, my heart's content without having to worry about the Canadian government, uh, you know, having a feeling one day that we don't like the color of this rifle and we're going right. to change its uh, classification from non-restricted to prohibited or whatever. They're they're nuts here, nuts nuts so, with their loss. Well, you, I, I just want to be the first one to invite you. Come on, come on down. Thank sure. you. We need we need more freedom loving people here. So I agree. But that brings yeah. up an interesting point too. Is someone had mentioned very early in the chat that none of us mentioned firearms, and obviously I think in our videos about the bug out bags, and I think the reason is that we all consider them to be fairly ubiquitous in this context. That you would obviously want to have. A firearm, if you're in, a, in, if at all possible, in a bug out situation, but it's also something that you wouldn't necessarily be using. Hopefully, you know, like you absolutely will be using your knife, your camping equipment, your water purification stuff like that. Hopefully, you won't have to use your gun, but I think it's fairly ubiquitous, and that's why we didn't necessarily mention it. And I and I put I did I did have firearms as my bonus item, but it wasn't right. as my my top five. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and yeah. I mentioned that is obviously these are your, some of your core defense items, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what were you, you were going? What were we going to talk about this, as far as the floods in Venezuela and stuff? We got a little just bit. any any comments on it. Just my thoughts are always that these. Just I like to point out when there's things happening that like this yeah. is why we prep type stuff. You know, yeah, we yeah. talk about massive grid down events. Yeah, we talk about red dawn type stuff. But for the next fifty hundred years or whatever, these are the type of things that are most likely going to happen to you where your preps and preparations would come into play. Regional events like this. This is perfect. So, like, about half an hour in every trifecta, we should have, like, the Lord Humongous Corner, where Eric comes in and says, okay, guys, this is what's going on. What do you guys yeah. think? <laughs> Does he have to say it with a lisp like that? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> this is what's going on, guys. <laughs> oh, shit. I, I, okay, so in all seriousness, um, I, I think we're there's, there's always, if you look at any part of the planet, there's always some degree of some disaster somewhere. Exactly. I mean, and I brought up with my video the other day on Venezuela is, you know, we've got real life disaster or socialism happening mm -hmm. there. And it, it's just, it's funny. It's it's weird to me how humans can turn on a TV, this this screen, 
look at the news, look at somewhere on the other side of the earth that's happening, like it was filmed within the last 24 hours, where people are literally shooting firearms in the air and, you know, there's tanks going down the street and people are crying and screaming and it's just, it's just like, oh, well, okay, look what happened over there in that country. That's cool. Click, click, click and go to, uh, you know, whatever, watch My Cousin Vinny or whatever, something redundant. It's, it's like there's this disconnect that humans have in Western society with respect to what's happening to other parts of the planet. And with, with respect to the flooding in Nebraska, that brings up an interesting point. It's almost like it's even internal because we had a fire here in Canada a couple of years ago in Fort McMurray. Where it was a real disaster. We were aware about it. I was obviously a little bit more aware than most people, but Canadians were like, oh, oh, there's a fire there. You know, whatever, disaster. It's almost like people need to experience a disaster or witness it in person in order for them to have an appreciation to a depth or level that you gentlemen have that like that we have yeah and one thing i like also i agree i'd like to point out about these situations is that these are usually typically not without rule of all situations you always get the best of both worlds i think preppers have this mindset that when things go bad there's this whole other uh, venue of options that will be available to them walking around you know full battle rattle they see someone trying to take food from their backyard they're just going to blast them you know the, the, the stuff is not usually the way it goes you sort of end up with the worst of both worlds where you don't have power, there is going to be some level of looting and violence, but you ha you don't have a totally without rule of law situation either. 100%, 100% spot on. And we also have another question here from Mr. Morris. Says, super dark chat. Question, yeah, super chat. Thank you, sir. The dark question for you three. What mental exercises have you done to prepare for lethal force in defense against like women, young adults, teens, or maybe even like desperate people, I guess, who aren't necessarily bad people, but yeah, it could be a potential. For me, I haven't done any specific mental exercises other than, you know, mulling over these things in my head ahead of time. And it comes down to, to me, it's all comes down to, you know, the current, I like the current legal limit of, are you fearing for your life or grievous bodily harm? And I think I would feel justified in that situation and using in lethal self-defense to defend myself or someone else in my family or my group. I can't say that I wouldn't be traumatized or troubled by it afterwards, but I'd like to think that I would not have too much issue acting in the moment, at least, hopefully. Ahead, what do you guys Jay. think? Me? Yeah, yeah what are you guys' thoughts on that? That's an interesting question. I mean, it, it sounds like this individual obviously has a, um, a significant a woman, a significant, a significant other, and uh, possibly children as well. It's one thing to say, what would you do to prepare yourself for defense? It's another to say, what would you do to prepare yourself for defense for a woman and a child? Because I, I think I don't care. Well, so against, against women and kids. Like, so potentially, my, my interpretation was that if you have to use force against what would be considered weaker people, and you have oh, to use lethal force. It wrong. It's like in defense, like if I had to take care of, like yeah, if there's a twelve-year-old kid who's about to shoot you or something, are you? Yeah, he done? said he said in the comment in the chat, Mr. Morris said he said I asked this because most gangs that are coming at you are under twenty-five years old. So they're gonna be younger. kids, basically. Yeah. Okay, that's easy for me. A woman, no problem. You want equality? Bang! You've got equality. Uh, with respect to children, young adults, teens, malicious, ignorant, criminality, I think it's pretty obvious to to any anybody that's in preparedness that that's that's inevitable if there's a disaster there's going to be crime if there's going to if crime is most likely going to be conducted by uh the i don't say lower level but uh teens will definitely be no problem no problem shoot them in the head whatever it doesn't matter i don't care where your age is where your color skin and is. i agree i mean i think it's a situation it's not about who's doing it to you like for it doesn't matter to me if it's going to be an old person a 10 year old like for me the the threshold is what's being done am i or in my family or my group having the fear for their life or grievous bodily harm things like that i think the most more important question is readily or mentally readying yourself because and not necessarily expecting these all to be bad people this could be someone who you might be doing the same thing in their position you know what i mean if they're trying to to fight for their family and their group and you still might have to use some kind of lethal force against them just to defend your people and uh because you're going to be put in marginal situations potentially. It's not always necessarily going to be easy to say, oh, this person's super bad. 
And you can't let that cause you any hesitation if you need to act in any significant way. So I would say that um, it's it's hard. I think it's harder than – so a, a threat is a threat, right? Just like you were saying, Che. Like it, I don't care if it's a female, if it's a, it's a young person, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and I've – been a law enforcement officer for 19 years. So we've done a lot of like fats simulated training and stuff like that, where, you know, you have people coming at you with shovels and you got to, you know, shoot them. And, and it's like a video screen in front of you. And you have this, this gun that simulates a, a real, real weapon and you have to do it. And it's, and it's not hard in the moment to take care of those things, to, to deal with a threat to your life in general. But where it, where it is hard. And I think, you touched on this, Eric, is the after effects of it. Like dealing with the psychology afterwards, um, you know, is is proven to be time and time again in law enforcement shootings, you know, across multiple countries all over the world. Um, you know, when guys shoot um, young kids and stuff like that, it's harder to get over. I mean, you, you know that you were right, like that it was a threat, right? You, you know that right. part. But there is a, a lot more of a devastating mental effect and stuff like that. So what I've done, just me, is, is two. there's two particular books, and I've talked about them several times on, on different live streams, but On Killing and On Combat by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I think those are probably the two best books uh, that talk about the psychological effects of killing and what to expect afterwards, what to expect during, and, 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 and they tell stories of things that people went through and all that kind of stuff. And I can't recommend those books highly enough for people who are, you know, concerned about that because the mental effects afterwards are real and very tangible, and they do affect uh, the way that you go about doing things after that. Especially if you started doubting yourself in the moment. Like I said, I think, a, and, and training comes into this too. If you, if you haven't gone through exercise and gone through certain types of training, you're not necessarily going to be act, be able to act like that in the moment. So it's, it is useful to do some kind of exercises. But once you've reached that point, at least that's taken care of. And then the sort of the PTSD effects, for lack of a better word, are something totally different. There's not necessarily a whole lot you can do about that always. Because like I said, you might be put in these marginal positions where you have to uh, act against people who you sort of would be able to sympathize with, too, if you were watching a movie of the situation, you know. But... You just have to decide ahead of time that your survival and the survival of your loved ones and are is more important. Absolutely. You see that super chat for yeah, nine ninety nine survival for the super chat as well. I appreciate it. If you have any question, let us know. Obviously, I put a link to his channel in the chat so you guys can check out his channel too. Appreciate it. That was a that was very nice. Did you have any question in particular, Jeepin, that we can get to? Mr. Morris says Che is my new drinking buddy. Hmm. I'm just, you know, I'm still reflecting what both of you guys said. I mean, that really, really intelligent insight there from both of you guys. Uh, I recall reading years ago that, generally speaking, I don't know what the training is like today, but they have to, they, they condition soldiers to literally, and with all due respect, I mean, this with the utmost respect, they can train soldiers in some respects the way that they can train pigeons to pull the trigger on command. And it, it's almost like a mechanical function that, or a process that soldiers go through. Uh, the psychological and emotional effects afterward, which I didn't even foresee when JD was saying, of course, yeah, of course, it's going to be psychologically more detrimental uh, with respect to a child and a woman, irrespective of the fact of me pushing my equality notion. Sure, you, you, you have to be impartial. If there's, if there's a threat, it doesn't matter who it is. If they're 12 years old or 80 years old, it doesn't matter what the threat is. But after the fact, sure, there's going to be probably some sort of uh, dire psychological um, effect on you. There's no doubt about no doubt about that. How you prepare for it, you, you can't. I don't think there's any sort of preparedness you can take. There's nothing you can do. Well, to I don't know. For, I, I think you can. I think if you learn about the well, process, there's, there's probably things you can do. You can. Yeah. There's, there's there are things, but you know, we can we can all practice to to go to space, but. <laughs> You know what I mean? And we'll, well do it. When we're, talking, when we're talking strictly about the mental aspect, too, you run a risk of, you know, you don't really want to put yourself in a position where you could easily kill people and not feel anything after it, you know? Like, is that really what you're trying to do, you know? Yeah. I remember, um, I mean, like, obviously, you've seen, 
What's that? I was just going to say better analogy. It's, and I agree with JJ. Yes, there would be things you can do to can do with respect to some sort of exercise or visualizations or whatever. Um, but it, it, the, the best analogy, well, not the best, the one that I came up with right now, it's like walking on hot coals if you've never done it before. You can do all sorts of training to build you up to be able to do it and do it, but you're not going to know what it feels like until it actually happens. Yeah. And I think have you walked on goals? Have I? Yes. No, we tried it. We were going to. We. I've got one guy as a. Let's see, so he's a I, ninja. I was going to just. I was going to just spill a little secret and and sure. see if, if anybody knew this. You know what they, what they do is they cover it in ash. They cover okay. the coals in ash, and the ash is not hot, and the ash is a very good insulator, and it keeps them from burning your feet. <laughs> also, I, my my analogy would be. Um, it's sort of like training for some kind of sporting event. You can do all the physical training you want, get super good at making the throws, making the catches, but none of that can really prepare you for choking in the big game with 50,000 people watching, things like that. And there's not a whole lot you can do to really imitate that, that kind of pressure, that kind of mental uh, stress. There's some things you can try to do to be ready for it, but yeah, like Che was saying, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do to really mimic that without going through it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a tough situation for sure. So Doug Larrabee asks, any thoughts on possible civil war in America? I took a poll recently. I thought this was interesting. I took it in our, our Prepper, Prepper Skills Facebook group. And you guys all are more than welcome to join it. We'd love to have you in there. Um, and uh, the poll, let me, let me just, I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, I, I basically asked, what's your, what, what's your opinion on uh, civil war happening, you know, in America and, and how likely or how soon do you think it, it is to happen? And uh, I thought the results were interesting. Let me just scroll down to it here real quick. I think it was 124 people said it's likely within uh, within 10 years. But what was more interesting than that is 50 some people said it was highly likely within two years. I don't know if I agree with that. I've mentioned on my channel in multiple videos that I don't think civil war is going to happen in a traditional sense in the U.S. simply for one major reason, that there are not two sides that would be going to war predominantly. We're much more fractious than that. The identity groups and the identity politics that are happening are, are much more diverse, for lack of a better word than there being two sides. Like when you have the American Civil War, there's you know one or two major issues and dif definite regions. You don't have that here. I agree with um, Vox Day and others that we could potentially see some kind of breakup of the country amid massive civil unrest you know, in another 10 or 15 years. But it wouldn't be because there were two particular sides going at it. It would be much more um, uh, convoluted than that, I think, just on demographics alone. Che, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I'm not American. Uh, I don't know much about America or American politics. You guys have uh, what's his we name? Got a Trump. New president. That... His name's Trump. Yeah, it's Trump. Okay, I am not for or against Trump. I'm completely neutral. Well, he, he's almost he's almost got all the Infinity Stones, so you won't have to worry about it soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's difficult to say. Who's to say that you know? I it very very difficult to foresee. You know, to rub a crystal ball and, and and see America going to civil war. If I were to bet, if this were a game and we we're sitting at the, you know, we got our tuxedos on and we're gambling, and they're like, "Okay, Che, what's your bet? What's the card going to be? Are they going to go to civil war in the next ten years or not? America going to go to civil war or not?" I'd say no. I don't think it's going to happen unless something radical happens, like uh, AOC comes into power. In which I would almost embrace that because you know what that would mean. I would almost want her to come into power, and I'll tell you why. Because all the rich and smart people are going to come to Canada, and you guys are going to be left with Jack. So it's going to be a lot for Canadians because we're going to get this huge influx of, of money because the billionaires are going to be like, what the hell is this Green New Deal? Well, we have to, like... Airplanes have to stop flying in 10 years? Are you nuts? You have to rebuild, rebuild every building in America or something like that? <laughs> yeah, we're going to rebuild every building. But that's a good point because like, in a situation like that, I was actually just going to mention, say this craziness happens, what's happening in the Democratic Party right now here 
proves that there are not two like what two groups would be fighting each other. You have you can see what's happening with uh, the um, representative Ilan Omar, whatever her name is, where all the Democrats are fighting amongst themselves. Like, oh, sh is it okay to make fun of Jewish people, or you know, is it not is it not okay to criticize them? I mean, you're seeing this kind of fracturing just within one party, and it, at, in people who are already you know elected officials, and it's, it's just way more fracturing in these groups than there would be necessary to have uh, like a. I guess I'm quibbling over the definition of civil war, but I do not think there will be a civil war. I think there will be conflict and potentially fracturing, but not a civil war. Okay, excellent point. Contingent, though, on, in, in my worldview, on, let's just say AOC slid into the cracks. Somebody as delusional and mental as her could wake up one day and her eggs Benedict were a little runny and say, well, <laughs> ban all You, you mean her uh, huevo rancheros? Let's just yeah. Let's let's just ban the boss now, right? You, you right. heard her say that. She like that would work now. So I mean, <laughs> she's what's right. Uh, she actually said this. She's she's like, well, you know, and and, I, and I'm paraphrasing. It may have been in different conversations, but essentially, you know, the day after she was inaugurated, huh. which they're not inaugurated. Right. <laughs> um, she she's the boss and she's in charge now. <laughs> right. Okay. I, that, I love I love. I love Alexandria Casio Cortez. What she has done for the Democratic Party yeah. is going to take 50 years to repair. I mean, every time she gets in front of in front of a camera and talks, it is just ensuring another conservative president is going to win the next election. That's what people say, but I disagree for one simple reason is that it's only galvanizing the people who already know they're idiots against them. Everyone on their side is eating this shit up. They love her. No, even look at the walk away movement. Look at the hashtag walk away movement. Okay, it's yeah. growing and growing and growing like leaps and bounds. People are looking right. at this going, you're fucking retarded. Look at I the mean, Jay, Jay was Democrats. a hardcore socialist yeah. until until he saw, you know. Right. But so, look who's flooding our side. I'm sorry, JJ. I'm leaning towards Eric on this. I think there's, well, maybe there's, there's probably a little bit of both happening here. But th there are people that are – lapping it up they love aoc she can come out tomorrow with a speech to say hey we're gonna ban uh gasoline in 10 years no more gasoline right. for the environment come up with a new technology and people will love her they'll like the post they'll share on facebook they'll take instagram photos with hey. you know like they'll eat you it know, up there are people you, you meant that you meant that as hyperbole right <laughs> hyperbole yeah. what do you mean yeah, you meant that as hyperbole, but that was basically part of her new Green Deal. That is really? actually something they're she is saying. Asking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that as a joke. Yeah. That's but the point, the point being, she she was saying this stuff. Like I, I call it the Pedro platform, like I mentioned before. Vote for me, and all your wildest dreams will come true. And uh, that, that she got elected. I mean, there's people who support this stuff. And like I said, yeah, you're seeing okay. a fracturing within the party. But there's plenty of young people, plenty of people who, you know, legal immigrants and everything, who they are totally down with the sure whatever i don't care if this is works or not but you're going to be sending out the checks and i like it and let's do it kind of thing the problem and I'll, I'll let me give me my 30 second summary i don't want to get too off track here the problem is stupidity and ignorance and most people are stupid and ignorant especially on the democratic side no offense with respect to a o c if they support her because the propositions she's she's making i was talking to a friend with this uh the other not to a few weeks ago we were ice fishing and my example was she would be screaming, two plus two is five. Two plus two is five. And it doesn't make any sense to us gentlemen because obviously two plus two does not equal five. But five equals a solution that is so beautiful where unicorns are prancing around and the rainbow goes into two gold pots <laughs> and uh, leprechauns are jumping around everywhere that... And, and with so much conviction, with so much passion, with so much enthusiasm, that people are just loving how she's saying the message, but not right. the message. Because when you scratch that lottery ticket and you don't see three shiny bells at the, uh, you know, when you've scratched all off, guess what? It's worth jack shit. And that's that's where I see AOC. If you look into any, you know, we'll get like a grade three student and say, okay, look. Is AOC, is anything she's saying actually feasible? A grade three student will say, well, no, we can't just extinguish airplanes. How are people going to get to 
the UK and travel, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's the passion and the conviction. It's the feeling. Yeah, it comes down to the difference between rhetoric and dialectic. And you can't defeat convincing rhetoric, which doesn't have to be truthful, by pointing out that it's wrong. It just doesn't work that way. And there's a huge group. I mean, Aristotle talked about this stuff. There's people who cannot be convinced with logic. They operate exclusively on a rhetorical level. And that's the people that she is uh, get, getting gathering. Yes. So pointing yeah. out that she's dumb and she's wrong, it means nothing to them. Right. Right. It's no, diff it's no difference than us saying, like, look, this isn't technically an assault rifle. Why do you keep saying it's an assault rifle? They don't care. Like, even if they, if we convince them of that, then they're going to say, okay, well, we want to ban whatever that thing is. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's technically an assault rifle or not. Yeah, and that's why I'm on Eric's side, JJ, so. That's okay. There's no, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Um, so Doug <laughs> says, <laughs> so, so Doug, Doug Larrabee says, what if the people stand and take over for the government? So here's, here's my thoughts on the only way that a civil war would ever be possible in the United States. And that is, is that it, with this new law, I don't know if you guys call, saw this law in Missouri where they're basically using, you know, nullification essentially. And they're, 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 they're basically saying that, the federal laws on these on these topics are not going to be enforced within this state. If more states did that and we got to a point where they did it on like um, South Carolina, I think just did it on abortion. Um, Missouri's doing it on gun control. If that thing, if that trend keeps going down the line and we start to the states start to nullify federal power enough then I think it's possible because the only, the only way, the only way that it's going to happen is if, if the conservatives stand up on a local level and get their governments to say, we've had enough, you know what I mean? Cause you can't do it on a federal level. It's too hard. You have to work locally. And then, and then when that result piles up on end and you have all the red States against the few blue States, then you could see something that could end up happening. Yeah, uh, and I, I think something like that will happen. But just like I said, due to demographic numbers and stuff, I don't think potentially, hopefully, it wouldn't be an actual conflict. It would just be like, you know what? These two or multiple groups in the country are so now different in their ideologies that there's no point in trying to find a candidates or, or rules that are in the middle. It's best to just have different, you know, have the states, you know, break free from the union and potentially, sure. hopefully – that would be allowed to some extent without well, having that's, that's what fight. that's what the southern states thought you know during the civil war they thought well we'll band together and we'll just secede i mean the problem is is that those people in power of the of the federal government aren't going to want that now i don't believe that the american military will go along with it i don't think that they'll i don't think they would that that 80% of them um, would even would even contemplate going along with it but it's not to say that there couldn't be a war started um, with the other 20% or so that would stay and that there couldn't be, you know, violence happening and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I would, I would certainly, certainly not want to ever see it happen. But I think the only way that it does is if, if conservative states literally get their shit together and start saying we've had enough. You know, I mean, you have to start locally and, and, and that kind of thing, because it is getting out of hand here. I mean, it's it's a little worse in Canada. You know, I mean, you guys, you don't even have really have freedom of speech anymore, do you, Jay? No, no, we don't. No, it sucks. Um, you know? And that's why, well, I'll give you my 30 seconds uh, version of it. We had a, a, a law introduced called Bill C-16, which yeah. prohibits the, uh, the use of uh, preferred pronouns to... We're not prohibits. It's the first time in legislative history, and our, our law is based off of British North uh, British law, basically British common law. Yeah, it's common law, yeah. The first time in history, the government has forced you, like forced compelled speech, where if Prepper Z says, "I identify as this, they, them, zer, zip, blah, whatever," then I have to address. The, the onus is on the onus is on me to address the individual by their preferred made up snowflake unicorn rainbow pronoun. Otherwise, I'm criminally I, I'm I'm liable. I'm criminally liable, and it's asinine, bat shit, 
crazy uh, that we have these laws. Because I could say to a Canadian, another Canadian, I could say, well, I want to be called Shamak. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's my pronoun, right? Because I made it up because I like it, right? It makes me feel good. And if you don't call me Shamak, then you can go to jail. It's, I, I really want to swear. It's, it's crazy. It's lunacy. You know? yeah, it's, literal, it's literal insanity. Yeah, yeah. But you guys have something similar to that in, in New York. Similar to that. They we're, tried, we're just... I understand they, they did pass something like that. I don't, and here, it, it, I don't think there's any way that could stand up to appeals at higher court levels simply because of First Amendment and things like that. It's, gonna, it's hard to imagine how they would justify that legally, but it's ridiculous that they're even trying, obviously. The strange thing about it is is it's for less than 1% of the population. Yeah, we're talking about a tiny, it's tiny a group. A tiny, tiny fraction of people. And and most of those people really don't care one way or another. They're like, I'm this or this. And that, you know, it's it's not... I, there's really... I think there's really two Americas. I, I really, I really do. I mean, I, I do fall into that idea. When you look at the voting map, of the red and the blue states and that kind of thing it's we have 10 percent of the population that is really really loud on social media and in media affairs and all that kind of stuff that are presenting the image of what america is upset about and standing for right but honestly 70 to 80 percent of the whole you know geographically the middle of the country is like no <laughs> we're not at all you know yeah, what i mean yeah thousand people emailing some big company just 10 times a day and they if they feel like they're you know the whole country's against them but it's really not well, like what they what they've done to fox that whole business model of destroying the the hosts on fox is very effective going yeah. towards their advertisers you know and they've they've completely just demolished that network i mean they went from being number one cable news for 30 years in a row to you know, down in the down in the slums with everybody else. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and it's it's people are gonna have to. Uh, that's why I don't get mad when people do the the same thing to the other side. I don't think that's preferably the way that you would want to have things operate. But it's better than having it done to you and not doing anything in return. And I'd rather just burn that whole system down to the point where people realize, like, look, all right, somebody's gonna be yelling at us no matter what we do. So we're just gonna stop kowtowing to the outrage mobs, regardless of the side. And unless it's an extremely egregious criminal action or something, we're just going to ignore people being mad at us. I'm hoping we're getting close to that point. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I really don't. I, I think it'll be interesting to see. I, if I, I Go ahead. If conservatives don't organize locally, nothing's going to change. And we're going to end up being a socialist country. We're going to end up being Canada. Yeah. I mean, ah. the, 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 real, the real problem, the real problem is is that as a general rule conservatives are independent minded they're usually type a you know personalities they they they're they're not generally you know followers they're independent minded they think on their own and um, they don't like to work together in social type settings and that's a, that's a huge problem for the conservative movement yeah. um, if if they I don't have, have know, like to fight i think is the problem too they think they look at these things and say oh we don't do that or and I've used the example of like when you're if you're playing a football game and the other team starts, you know, kneeing you in the groin, like one or two, you're like, all right, look, you shouldn't do that. We don't do that. But if the refs aren't assessing penalties and one team is getting away with this the whole time, you have a you have to realize you're not playing a football game anymore. And you either have to concede that you are just gonna get destroyed or you have to start kneeing them in the groin back. Mm -hmm. Right in the balls. Right, right in the balls. <laughs> I I wanna retort JJ's, you were saying you're gonna end up like Canada. I don't. Think, <laughs> we're not. We're not there yet. Things are. Well, we're, we're not either. That's my point. <laughs> we got a new prime minister later this year. We got a new prime minister. Trust me, Trudeau. This idiot that's been riding the wave off of his father's name. Are you basically. guys gonna elect a conservative finally, or what? Next, well, later this year. Yeah, there's a gentleman named Andrew Shear who's definitely gonna win. And I'll bet you my channel. I'll let you run my channel for six months. You can. I get to choose your video topics for a month. There you, there you go. Fine. There you go. Yeah. Both <laughs> of you guys. Whatever. He's definitely going to win because he's. He, we've got a bit of a scandal going on right now. 
with respect to a company called SNC Lavalin out of Quebec, and he tried to pressure our prime minister tried to pressure the attorney general to change the law so that this company could get away with corruption mm. for the sake of Canadian jobs, uh, which is all fine and dandy. You know, Canadian jobs are good, but there's a bit of scale there. You can't say, well, we need to get away with, you know, changing. You can't change the law to appease a company. Basically, a company that's been notoriously. I mean, America's been doing it for a hundred years. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Fair. Well, and it, long and the short of it, he's done. He's out of there. We've, we've got a prime. And the cool thing too about about Sheer is he's actually he's he's got buddies that are into firearms, so he understands the the hoops that we have to jump through. None of these other idiots do. Trudeau doesn't. I mean, he was a drama teacher, substitute drama teacher. This is the guy that we had that we have right now running our country. You know, he's not a career politician. He's just. Well, I mean, AOC was a bartender like you know seven weeks ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is scary. Which is yeah. I would, I, would, I would let her into my survival compound to like hold the palm frond to fan me with or something, but she gets no privileges. Yeah, yeah I'd let her. I'd let her do something in my survival compound. But we, have, we definitely have something in common then, because AOC is you know, she was nothing. She's. My guess is, and she's young too. What is she like, early thirties? Thirty-two or something. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, she's not I, young enough to to run in, for twenty twenty. I remember. So okay, but she's young enough that 2040, 2050, like, in in the next decade, I wouldn't be surprised if she ran for president. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. I can't even. I dude, if that happens, I don't even know. I, I don't even. You're I, gonna come to Canada. I'm gonna move to Canada. Door. Or something. I, I don't know. That's, yeah, Canada. Yeah. Easier, easier transition. You know, I used to. It's funny. Um, when I was younger, we talked about <laughs> we, we we talked about uh, if we ever got separated in some kind of a disaster or something, and like you know, like some apocalyptic event or whatever. Uh, I picked a place on the map. I looked and I was like, okay, let's just meet here, and it was Saskatoon, Canada. And, uh -huh. and it wasn't until years later when I realized that Saskatoon is a massive fucking city. It's a, you know, it's a big city. It's not like, it's not like just some little podunk place. And <laughs> so I think that's kind of funny. It just no, it's my lack of geography, it's it's geography when I was Canada. running. What's is that? Canada just, is that what you think Canada is? Is just a bunch of small little. Yeah, exactly. You know, just, just somewhere in the middle of the middle, you know, just eh, right there. It's. It's in this yeah. it's nothing, you know. But, like a maple, yeah. maple syrup stand, and I don't know something else. Exactly. <laughs> you, hey, you live, in, you live and learn. Actually, you know? just, I just went to Canada for the first time. I went to Vancouver. It was fun. I had a good time. Yeah. Cool. What'd you do up there? I went and ate oysters for like sixty cents because I got that exchange rate, baby. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, there, and that's you know, and even going back to the original part of this video that, with respect to the. the with what people would do when they bug out, the items that we get, it, it largely depends where we are geographically. And I think it's the disparity between the three of us. It's always going to be that between the three of us moving forward, as long as we continue the trifecta, is 75% of our country. We, I live in a huge country that's untouched wilderness. Sasquatch could be real, you know, because there's just so many places within within – Canada, that it just it's untouched wilderness. It, it's very easy for some people um, to just disappear. I, I think me and JJ had talked about this before that it it might not be so practical for like for you where you live, where it's you know within fifty mile radius, you've got there's there's a house, there's there's the gas station or whatever. That's not the case in Canada. There's multiple places you can disappear months, years on end and never be detected. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get some questions in people. I got this chat window here. I'm looking for capital letters. Yeah. And you've got three survivalists here, three preparedness individuals. You've got us live. Give us an intelligent question. We're talking about the top five bug out bag items, either that you like or that you deem is necessary. Yeah, we got way off topic, but that's <laughs> yeah. we good. We haven't mentioned shooting or anything like that yet, so fingers crossed. So when are we going to do the one on Chase Channel is going to be next, right? We're going to be on Chase Channel next. Okay. And um, and and are we are we did we agree on the topic of uh, 
say top 10 things preppers need to stop doing or, or top sure. five, we can do top five, whatever. I mean, we'll tell you what, let's actually let me cut you in right there. Let's do it on your channel next JJ, because I'm actually going to be updating my internet and whatnot. So just to play it safe, we'll mm -hmm. just say your channel. Okay, if it's two weeks, three yeah, weeks from now. If you don't, if you don't want to, I mean, I, I thought maybe it would, might help get you, you know, some more subs or something or whatever, but if you want, it's all good. All good. It's all good. Let's do it on yours because I, I need to do some infrastructure internet stuff here first. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, so definitely JJ's. Uh, what's the topic? What do you guys want to do? Top X, however many things preppers should stop doing. Five or ten, okay. whatever you guys want to do. And, okay, and what's your number, Eric? Five or ten? Um, I'm cool with five. JJ? Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. I mean, I'll end up doing three times that anyway, so it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Always breaking the rules. Do we want no, to do, I, do we have any topics? Uh, just, ideas. You know, it, it, my, my idea for the, the, the topic on this video was just that it was something I was going to, I was going to do a video on it. And, and it was something that I was, I would try to come at with the perspective of, you know, the goal of preppers when they're interacting with other people should be to get more people to prep. Right. Like that, that should be the, the ultimate goal because the more people that are prepared in general, like when you're in these, you know, f social media groups and Facebook groups and all that kind of stuff, like we should try to be encouraging people to do, to be more prepared because every person that decides to prep is one other person that I don't have to worry about showing up at my door. So there's a lot of stuff that happens between preppers that just drives people away and really shuts down conversation and learning. And so that was what my video was going to be geared towards is like, let's stop doing this stupid shit and, and start trying to be encouraging and helpful and educating other people, you know? So that was kind of the spirit of where I was coming from with that one. I like it. Yeah. I'd like to do something on Eric's uh, fishing kit. Yeah. Uh, so if you oh. want to send me a, a sample out, yeah, these are it almost be done. Cool. I'll be sending one to each of you guys. So, what is it? Give us a spill. It's Let's just I had, I had gone. I was going through my bug out bag earlier, and I wanted to put together a small fishing kit. And I realized, started looking at the ones that were out there. I didn't like them. And once I started pricing building one, I realized that it would be kind of expensive unless I buy this, bought the stuff in bulk. So I was like, why don't I just make one and put it together? So okay. I'm in the process of building it. It's going to have what I noticed with most of them was that they had. Um, not that much of the things like the most of what you need is fishing line and hook. So I wanted to be really heavy on that. So I'm going to have, um, what is it? 80 meters of line, two different weights, 15 pound test and 30 pound test. I'm going to have 30 hooks of different sizes, little lures. You got, you can see the little tin light will come in a tin instead of a flip top one. It actually screws shut. I even have a, a couple treble hooks and even a little folding uh, multi tool, which isn't of the greatest. It's not of the greatest quality. Obviously, to keep the prices low, but it'll allow you to get hooks out and it fits. Sure. In the kit. So it's all in a little three-inch tin, so it should be pretty cool. Got more stuff in there, too. I'm not going to do the whole spiel now, but appreciate you bringing it up. And it will be on Amazon very soon, hopefully within the next five day to ten days. And then I'll ship out you guys some samples so you can check it out. What's the kit called? What do you call it? It's the Rule the Wasteland Survival Fishing Kit. Okay, that's so that's cool. I think for me to... To jump on the bandwagon to be impartial, um, I have to give it the Che test, which is I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass and say, "Wow, Eric, you go to buy Eric's fishing kit." No, I, don't, I, don't, I want honest reviews. Yeah, I, and I think that would be we we have to consider some sort of topic wrapped around that in the future. So maybe we'll do uh, JJ's suggestion. The following the following topic, something around your your product. I think that would okay. be cool. Yeah. Maybe uh, things you got you're missing, cool. missing from your bug out bag. A, Whatever. We got a super chat here, I think it's called. Yeah, because Caleb Block gonna... says, thanks for the show as always, guys. You do do you mind shouting out my channel? No problem. Go check out Caleb Block. Are you playing Star Wars music over there, JJ? Sorry, I was I was actually getting the link for Caleb's channel. Nerds, man. He's fucking nerds. <laughs> Caleb, tell us more about your channel. You paid, a, you paid a super chat here. Is it, are you a prepper? Are you uh, just looking for more publicity? And here's the funny thing with me. I'll just go on a little rant here for a second. With preparedness, 
some of these guys they get into it for um, it, it's exclusively just product reviews and selling stuff. And there's nothing wrong with making money. I mean, all of us would love to do what we do full time and get some sort of financial backing for that. I think the problem for some of the higher level channels, we'll say, or some of the channels that are 100K subs and more, is they fall into this the cesspool of wanting to. How can I? I, I got to be careful with my words here. It's like they. They get, they get stuck, and they, they go in one of two directions. It's like they, they either use fear-mongering to try and keep the audience that they have, or they use uh, endless product reviews for stuff that they don't necessarily have any experience with, but they support so, it anyway because they know they can get a kickback, a financial kickback from. So let me let me jump in on that a little bit because I've thought a lot about this subject, and there you're right. There There is a little bit of a trap. That, and and I, I appreciate you saying 100,000 100, so that you're, you're implying that it wasn't my channel that you're talking about, <laughs> like in your other video. <laughs> no, but um, but seriously, there, there, here's, here's part of the problem. Well, there, and there's a few things. One, you know, you, you, you want to create a video and you would like to have people watch it, right? So the, the idea is, is that you create a video and you have people watch it. So by and large, a lot of times the audience has a lot to do with the feedback on what they want to see, right? Because I have probably well over 300 or 400 videos on how to stuff, but it doesn't get watched. It just doesn't get watched. I mean, you know, I've got a lot of videos that have, you know, under 2000 views and a channel my size, that's, that's pretty crazy. You know what I'm saying? But that's because they're how to videos. Um, Gear reviews get a lot of views. And so in turn, you end up making more AdSense revenue. You also get, end up getting free gear and stuff like that. So it, it is a hard trap to, to fall into, you know what I'm saying? Uh, or to, to fight against. Um, because it, what I tend to do, my personal philosophy with my channel is, is I try not to do two gear reviews in a row. I try to always, if I'm going to do a gear review or something, then I always try to follow it up with an informational or a how-to video, uh, something that talks about something I've learned or something I'm doing on my, you know, my farm or whatever the case may be. Um, and I try to, to separate those things out. Um, but it is extremely discouraging when you have a large audience and you get, you, nobody watches a video that talks about something that's teaching you something like I did a video on typhoid not long ago. And let's be honest, typhoid is not a really, you know, invigorating topic, although it is something that's important to know for a preparedness minded individual because it'll kill you, you know. <laughs> um, but so I, I, I do understand what you're talking about, Che, as far as the the trap that people get into. But I also understand that for me, there's you know, I started the channel because I wanted to help people about wilderness survival and preparedness. But I also started the channel because I wanted to use the revenue and the stuff that I make from the channel to help my own family's preparedness level be increased. And so it's a hard line, I think, to balance. And, yeah. uh, and, and you know, that, I guess that's all I'll really say about it is, is that it is difficult. You, don't but you can, you can, I'm going to cut the cord right there. And I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't be talking with either of you guys if I felt that either of you have crossed that line. Even with Eric coming out with his fishing uh, product, I don't think that's crossing the line. I think that's a smart thing. There's nothing wrong with monetization on YouTube with respect to preparedness. Right. There is a line, though. Neither of you have crossed it, and I don't believe either of you are going to cross it because I believe there is an integrity that both of you have in which you're more passionate about discussing preparedness, um, embracing or taking on information about preparedness and sharing with others. And if it means a product review, it's not because you're taking on a product to do a review to, to, to make money. You're taking on a product because maybe there's some interest, maybe there's some sort of affiliation or whatever, but it's not from a, uh, it's not motivated. It's not profit driven. The wheel, the cog in the wheel isn't money, money, money. Where the line is crossed with other preppers. And it's obvious to me. And it's ironic we bring this up now because there's one prepper in particular that, 
it's it's a glowing fucking beacon of light. And I'm doing a, I've got a series called Arguing with Survival Experts, and I'm releasing it in the next day or two. Huh. Like, I just, like, swiveled that plug in there um, against this particular individual where I'm sure he he's ex-military. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I tap dance on it lightly because he's well over 100K subs, and he's a prepper. He's doing what you do, what I do, what Eric does, with respect to just shooting the shit, talking about products, talking about skills, talking about concepts, knowledge, and various things online. But they've crossed the line. They don't care about the audience. They care about a product. Their videos are infomercials. Like literally half the videos that they produce, it's like, why don't they just turn on, what, what's the channel? I don't know what it is in America. I think it's 27 here in Canada, where it's just, it's like 24 seven, here's the product. QBC, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, QBC. Yeah, QBC. Yeah, look at, look at that. This sucks up the dirt from the floor. You know, twenty nine ninety five first five hundred people. That's uh, yeah, what I, mean, I, I agree. It kind of comes down to you know it when you see it when these channels go over the line. You know that. Um, and I think, a lot here's of, the thing. I think a lot. Of here's the thing. Sorry, Eric. I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, but I, I just gotta get. I gotta get this off my chest. You you can see it, and JJ can see it. I can see it. We know. We know. We look at other prepper channels. You guys watch other channels. We know when people are full of shits. And they're out for a financial gain. We know. We can see it. And we know they're fooling the masses. You know, 90% of the people that watch our stuff are watching because there's a genuine passion to get into preparedness and learn stuff. And they don't realize they're caught in this web with some of the, you know, the master puppets, you know, Metallica analogy, where these these higher-ups that talk in authoritative voice, well, you need to get this now, blah, 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 blah. Click the link in the description. We know they're full of shit, you know. Thank you, Eric. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, no, I no needed problem, to get it off my no chest. That's exactly what I was saying. We're just becoming. Do you have a speaker on, JJ? I'm hearing my own voice. Not me. Yeah, okay. okay. Anyway, as long as you guys aren't getting any feedback. Yeah, it comes down to, I think, like, not everyone can know, know it when they see it, but we certainly can. And there's, I don't know exactly what. Hold on. That, that's your kidding. Let me look and make sure. I don't think I do. Yeah, you're hearing the. Hey, do you have any window open? Yeah, let me. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm so like emotional, but that last, it, like it, it bothers me. No, I, I, I see these guys. I see these guys that. Uh, no, I'm muted. I'm good here. These guys okay. that they get so much attention, and people so. I think what bothers me is there's so many preparedness individuals out there that want to get into this that soak it up. They love it. They lap it up like a dog, and it's garbage information. And nine times out of ten. It's a garbage product. This is something they don't need. It's going to work against them. But because the Super Prepper Channel 101 said, well, well you need to buy this item, uh, people just buy it. They get stuck into this financial cogwheel motivation. You know, you guys aren't there. I, I, I don't see either of you guys ever getting there. Yeah, you know, I I'll can't. Too much, right honestly, too much work to be that much of a shill. I'm too lazy. I'm too lazy. It'd be easy, well, it, for me, you know, being into, into marketing, out of all things, uh, at least one area of, of business that I tap dance, being self-employed, it would be very, very, very easy for me to get into preparedness and make money. I could make a lot of money at this, but at what at what cost? Oh, Integrity. If I, yeah, if I if I wanted to, uh, man, that is irritating. I know. I don't know who's it. It's not coming out of mine. I've only got two windows open, the chat and the other one. I'll close the chat. It's still doing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to talk anymore. Then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got to close everything. I'll close everything up here on my end. Okay. Can you hear me? I, think, I can still hear it somewhere. Wait, I think that did it. I don't hear it anymore. Hello? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Technology, man. Can't live with it. Can't live without it. Well, you know what? We're an hour and 20 anyway. You just want to call it? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say let's call it because that's that's got to be aggravating for the listeners. Yeah, it makes it so. I, I was having trouble thinking because I was hearing myself what's half second after I say it. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm sure I, don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure it's yours, but it's, I don't think it's mine. 
I've only got I've only got my window open. That's the only thing I have open. Yeah. So. Oh well. Yeah, we're we're at almost an hour and a half now, so we can go ahead and call it. So we're gonna officially do top five things Trevor should stop doing. Works for me. Did uh, Shay mute his? He's not hearing us at all. No, I'm not. Okay. Sorry, what did you say? I just said the next topic is officially going to be top five things Prepper should stop doing. Yeah, which is what? Uh, whatever. Okay, yeah, well, I'm good with that. Cool. Yeah. We're going to do that in two weeks. Go ahead. What's that? In two weeks? Yeah. Okay. So all right, be... yeah, sure. Thanks, guys, for embracing that little that little ramble that I went on to. Oh, uh, no so problem. We'll Two weeks today on JJ's channel. So we're going to release it, what, Saturday, 6 yeah. p.m.? Saturday at 6. Okay. You guys are good. Do you have any final thoughts? I do think we should make a secret channel that we just do all the stuff we're talking about that these people do just to see how many millions of views we can get and then expose it as a project. Like, haha, yeah, this is what happens when you just purposely try, like, make it all fear mongering and all product review, this, all this stuff. I have, <laughs> I have thought, you know, I, I've thought about doing that. Like, for the longest time, I've thought about doing like a, a conspiracy nut job video. Yeah, like, just, just voiceover. Shows, like, shows Russia and, and the dramatic music and the troops are here in America and the, right. the NATO vehicles <laughs> being put through and the new world order is coming to crush you. Yeah, and, it's all stock oh, yeah. footage about like, there's there's only three weeks worth of grain left in the United States, and half of it's got mice shit in it. There's gonna be food shortages in two days. I love it. You're I be love eating it. Hobo spleen for breakfast if you're one of the strong ones. Oh, it's easy. We could all wear balaclavas. Yeah, and this distort our voices. Yeah, just the same computer voice, like anonymous, every single time. Yeah, we make a video a week. And we eat you just bullshit. Any Dude, that would be just so. Be like, this is. You're gonna die unless you die. It's competent. <laughs> we probably make a million dollars and not be able to stop, and we'd be like, "Fuck, <laughs> what do we do?" All oh, right, that'd be awesome. That's that's a great idea. We that's need to talk about idea. that offline. Yeah, so offline. We'll Let's wrap off this up. Ignore everything you've heard, guys, for the last five minutes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. Yep. Thank Thanks ever so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks of so super chats and thank you everyone for watching. Go subscribe to JJ's channel and Chase. The link should already be in the description to my videos. In two weeks, we will each release our own videos, and then another maybe week or two after that, I'm not sure yet, we will have another live stream, probably on JJ's channel. So, thanks for watching, guys. We'll talk to you later. Signing off. <laughs>